also also uh, latoxan uh, of who, of which uh, video we just uh, we just uh, saw um, please let me uh, recall you again about the basic rules of our zoom meeting so please everybody turn off the microphone and video uh, please add your country code uh, before your name uh, and uh, if you wish to uh, 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 post a question, please use a chat uh, for this. I will monitor uh, the chat and I will uh, uh, I will uh, moderate the discussion after uh, the uh, first keynote uh, session. Uh, also, uh, all of the speakers, please uh, respect the allotted allotted time so that we are uh, on time. We have quite a busy schedule until uh, the evening, so. Uh, please uh, respect um, uh, what was planned uh, and suggested. Um, so uh, there's one more uh, there's one more notice um, during the night and in the morning there were some strange mails coming uh, uh, based on a UN uh, meeting. Uh, these are phishing mails, so please do not respond. Uh, really look carefully who sends them. Uh, in order to avoid any 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 problems or complications, uh, obviously we are so popular that we are getting uh, mm -hmm. unwanted attention also from <laughs> this kind of uh, this kind of uh, activities. Um, anyway, uh, so let's start the uh, keynote session uh, of today. Uh, we are really very pleased and proud that uh, Professor Glenn King uh, could join uh, the meeting as a plenary speaker. Um, let me introduce him really very briefly. Uh, he's a pioneer in the field of venom-based drug discovery, uh, in particularly the development of peptide therapeutics and bioinsecticides from spider venoms. Uh, his work uh, is involved with unraveling the structural and functional complexity of spider venoms and uh, the roles that are played by different classes of peptides uh, in prey immunization. So um, uh, it's worth to note that his laboratory at University of Queensland maintains the largest collection of venoms, venoms in the world. Um, he can uh, give the exact number, but it's uh, several hundreds of venoms from ants, assassin bugs, caterpillars, centipedes, consnails, scorpions, spiders, and so on. Uh, so if you wish to get uh, uh, <laughs> a, a particular type of toxin, untraceable toxin, maybe Glenn is, uh, maybe Glenn is a person to talk to. Um, so he is uh, also involved in translating the, the, the um, knowledge about uh, toxins and venoms to biomedical implications and is perfectly suited uh, uh, to start uh, this uh, third day, which is devoted to applications and biomedical implications of uh, venoms. Uh, among others, he was the founder of uh, Vestaron Corporation, uh, uh, an agriculture biotechnology company that is developing bee safe and eco friendly bioinsecticides. Uh, he's very successful as a scientist, uh, really publishing many uh, publications in form of book chapters, more than 20. Journal, scientific journal articles, more than uh, 200, and uh, so really a lot. And uh, for his work, he has received many, many um, awards. This is also worth to mentioning, uh, uh, for example, Beckman Carter Discovery Science Award uh, in 2013, uh, medal, for example, Medal of the Australian and New Zealand Society for Magnetic Resonance in 2015. Uh, impact IMB Impact Award for Discovering Innovation in 2016, and so on. Uh, Professor King is also currently editor in chief of a uh, uh, journal devoted to toxins and venoms, Toxicon. Uh, so we are really looking forward uh, to the lecture, and uh, I give you the floor, uh, Glenn. Please. Um, thank you very much, Gregor, for that far too kind introduction. Um, can I share my screen now? Yes, yes, Professor, yes. Okay. Can you see my screen? 
Yes, we see, see your screen. screen. Yes. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Gogo, for that that really kind introduction. Um, and I also want to really congratulate the organisers on what's been a fantastic conference so far, and congratulate everyone who was involved in putting this network together because I think it's a really important development for the field, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here. For those of you that don't know what we do. Uh, as Gregor mentioned, our major interest is using arthropod venoms as a source of peptide drug leads for treatment of human disorders with high unmet medical need. And we focus on arthropods. We have venoms from more than 500 species of arthropods. And you may ask, why do we solely focus on arthropod venoms? And there are, in fact, several answers to that question. But the first and most obvious one is the vast majority of venomous taxa are actually arthropods. So there's probably more than a million species of venomous arthropods. Uh, and that compares, for example, to about two and a half thousand species of venomous snakes. And so most of the biodiversity in venomous animals is actually contained in the arthropods. The other reason we like arthropod venoms is that they're rich in highly stable disulfide constrained peptides of the type that serve well as drug leads. And to give you an example, we published a paper last year in PNAS that showed the venom of one of our favorite spiders, the Kagari funnelweb spider, contains over 3,000 peptides. Now, if you look at the transcriptomic analysis we published of the various superfamilies of toxins in that venom, there are 33 classes of toxins or superfamilies, and there are certainly some protein classes, but you can see that the peptides absolutely dominate the venom of this particular spider and indeed of most spiders. And what's more, all of these classes of peptides, these 25 different superfamilies, all contain a minimum of two disulfide bonds. And because these peptides are constrained in this way, they tend to be, they tend to have incredible potency, selectivity and stability. And I'm going to exemplify that today with the peptide that I'm going to talk about. The other reason we really like arthropod venoms is that they are the richest known source of ion channel modulators. And our primary interest is human disorders in which ion channels play a key role in the etiology of the disease. And you may think, well, doesn't that limit you in terms of human disease? And the answer is no, it doesn't really. It turns out for biologic drugs, ion channels are actually the most common drug target, even, even more so than GPCRs. For small molecule drugs, the major human drug target are, is actually GPCRs, as you can see here, 33% of all small molecule drugs target GPCRs, but the next largest class is ion channels. So there are an enormous number of ion channel drugs out there, but many ion channels are very difficult to drug with small molecules because uh, they don't have the selectivity that you need to stop them hitting related ion channels. So the story I want to tell you today relates to cardiovascular disease. It's the number one cause of death globally, as I'm sure you all know. But most of those deaths are due to, due to just two things, stroke and heart attack. So stroke and heart attack alone cause the deaths of 15 million people every year. And that's almost 30% of all deaths every year. And the socioeconomic burden is enormous because these the survivors of stroke and heart attack often have very significant morbidity, either, either um, heart um, failure down the track or in the case of stroke, uh, debilitating disabilities. And it's believed that, or it's predicted at least, that by 2035, the, the socioeconomic cost of stroke and heart attack in the United States will be over $1 trillion. So if you look at the global cardiovascular drug market, it's actually enormous. It's about $90 billion. But despite that, there's actually not a single drug available to prevent the tissue injury caused by either stroke or heart attack. The only drug at all that's available for both of those diseases or disorders is a tissue, is a clot busting drug called tissue plasminogen activator. So because there's no drugs that can prevent the tissue injury though, that's why these disorders have high mortality, high morbidity with long-term impact on survivors and significant ongoing healthcare costs. And consequently, there's a huge unmet medical need for safe and effective cardioprotective and neuroprotective drugs. 
So we became interested in these two disorders due to our interest in a really interesting and unusual class of ion channels called acid sensing ion channels or just ASICs. And ASICs are proton gated channels. In other words, they're activated by acid. The ligand for these channels are just protons. They're expressed primarily in the peripheral and central nervous system. There are four genes that encode six subtypes because some of them are alternatively spliced. And the functional channels are actually trimers, either homo or hetero trimers. This on the right here is the first ever structure determined of a, an ASIC, an acid sensing ion channel. This is chicken ASIC 1A or chicken ASIC 1. And the three different subunits in the trimer are colored differently. What's interesting is if you do a surface rendering of the three-dimensional structure and you map the electrostatic potential onto that surface, there's a very deep acidic pocket, this deep red region here. This is full of aspartate residues and these are the residues that bind the protons. So when there's acidosis, protons bind here, the channel becomes activated and most of these channels carry sodium through the membrane. We were interested, as many other people were, in ASIC channels because of their role in pain. So some of the subtypes certainly play very important roles in nociception. So ASIC-3, for example, is found in the sensory afferents that innovate the heart, and it plays a really important role in ischemia-induced cardiac pain. Now, ASIC-1A, the channel that I'm going to talk about today, was initially thought to play a role in pain sensing, and it turns out that's probably wrong it's the splice isoform ASIC-1B that has an important role in pain. But ASIC-1A is highly pH sensitive. So it's half activated at a pH of 6.6. .6. And it's unusual and it's the only one of the ASIC channels that in addition to allowing influx of sodium, allows an influx of an, a reasonable amount of calcium as well. So the question is, what is the role of this channel? And our interest was piqued by this, what I think is a, a really seminal paper published in 2004. So only about five years after these channels were discovered in the laboratory of Michel Lesdunsky in France. What they showed is that in the context of a stroke in mice, if you knocked out ASIC-1A, you could reduce the size of the brain injury or the infarct by 60%. Now, that's an enormous reduction in the brain injury. Even a reduction in injury size of 10 to 20% would have a significant impact on behavioral outcomes because you're losing brain tissue in a stroke. So that, that was a really incredible finding and really piqued our interest. As I'll show you as the talk goes on, we've subsequently shown that ASIC-1A is not just found in the dendrites of brain neurons, but it's also found on the surface of heart muscle cells or cardiomyocytes. And we believe the reason that ASIC-1A has such a profound effect on brain injury is for the following reasons. When you get an arterial blockage, so for a stroke, this would be a block in a cerebral artery and a heart would be a block in a coronary artery, there's a decreased supply of oxygen to the tissue, the brain or the heart. And because of that, those tissues have to change the way in which they use fuel. And both cardiomyocytes and neurons are very energy hungry cells. So 60% of all the glucose that we use is burnt by our brain neurons. So they have to switch to anaerobic glycolysis to make fuel. And as you all probably know, the end result of anaerobic glycolysis is lactate. So the brain and the heart after stroke and heart attack end up with severe tissue acidosis in the most profoundly affected region of the organ, the pH can get as low as six. And I told you before that the pH for heart activation of ASIC-1A is 6.6. .6. So that channel is robustly activated during stroke and heart attack. And it causes injury to the brain or heart in two different ways. The first is, as I told you, it can cause the influx of calcium and increase the calcium overload that leads to apoptosis. But the other thing that, that has really only been discovered in the last couple of years is when the channel gets activated, it actually recruits a molecule called RIP1 kinase, which is a master regulator of a cell death pathway called necroptosis. And so when the channel is activated, it in turn activates the cell death pathways and actually causes the brain neurons and the cardiomyocytes to commit suicide. And so our simple hypothesis was if we could find a molecule 
that stop the activation of the channel under highly acidic conditions, then it should stop these cell death signals being sent to the heart muscle cells and the brain neurons and prevent injury to the brain or heart after stroke and heart attack. So where would we find such a molecule? Of course, we went looking in venoms. Our collection of venoms includes uh, venoms from over 500 diverse species from all around the world. But it turns out that happily, in this case, the winning molecule came from a local spider. So one of the spiders we've worked with, with a lot is the one I introduced earlier, the Kagari funnel web spider, Hedgenike infenza. The reason we like it is these spiders have very complex venoms. They're, they're quite ancient. Um, but they, they, they're, they're burrowing spiders. They live in the ground, so they can be very difficult to dig up. Kagari is the largest sand island in the world, and digging these things up in sand is, is a lot easier than digging them up in clay. And so this is myself and David Wilson digging up some of these spiders on Kagari. Now, we actually found this in uh, transcriptome rather than in the venom. So it was a genetic analysis that led to the sequence. And Sandy Pignardi, who was the author of the paper that I mentioned previously, found this sequence and pointed out its similarity to another molecule we had been working on in the context of stroke. And you can see it's a really large molecule. It's 75 residues, and it also has six disulfide bonds. So to put that in perspective, why that makes it complex is that those six disulfide bonds, if you do the mass, can form 10,395 different disulfide isomers. So you might think it would be very complex to make. But we had a fantastic uh, student in the lab at the time, Irene Chazignon from France. She was actually an undergraduate at the time. She decided that she would give it a go and try and make this peptide recombinantly in E. coli. She was very successful. She produced the right isomer in, in reasonable yield. And with Yan In Chin in the lab, she was able to solve the three-dimensional structure. And you can see the three-dimensional structure here shows clearly these two domains. And you can see uh, that this peptide has evolved via a gene duplication. So the first and second domain are homologs of one another. And in the animation on the right, you can see the six disulfide bonds shown in red. And the three disulfide bonds in each domain form a particular type of three-dimensional scaffold called an inhibitor cysteine knot or a knot and fold. And, and that particular fold is very common in spider venom peptides. And it, it gives these peptides some really peculiar characteristics. And let me show you why. The reason is that if we take the top disulfide bond in each of those uh, not in domains and the bottom one and the intervening sections of the polypeptide backbone shown here in gray, you can see it forms a ring. The third disulfide actually inserts through the center of that ring. So it bisects that ring. And you can see that better in the animation here, that third disulfide sulfide diving in the center and it effectively ties the peptide chain in a pseudo knot and gives these peptides incredible stability. So the peptide uh, this peptide, by the way, and I should have mentioned, this peptide we call HI1A because it's from the spider Hadronike and Fenzen. It was the first one we discovered in that family. And you can see if we look at the stability of this peptide, this is taking the peptide ex vivo in human serum and incubating it at 37 degrees for up to five days. And you can see there's hardly any degradation of this peptide in the serum at 37 degrees over a period of five days. So these, and that's not unusual for these peptides. That's typical of peptides with this particular knot and fold and another reason why we really like them from a therapeutic perspective. So the prediction was that this peptide would be a potent inhibitor of ASIC1A. How do we test that? It turns out this channel, and I know there's some people in the audience who work on these channels, very difficult to develop stable mammalian cell lines that express these channels. So we express them in oocytes. <clears throat> so we harvest eggs from the African clawed frog, Xenopus lavis. Um, we inject that with messenger RNA encoding for the ASIC1A channel. We wait a few days, the channel gets expressed. Uh, we, we then um, impale it with electrodes and we do something called two electrode voltage clamp electrophysiology. And the way we activate the channel, as you would expect, is we reduce the pH. Remember, these are pH activated channels. 
So we have the oocytes sitting at physiological pH. We very rapidly drop the pH to six, and you can see there's a massive influx of sodium here. And you can see this is the effect of a peptide that's known to be a very good inhibitor of azic one a called PCTEX1, discovered in Michelle Wisdonski's lab. And you can see three nanomole of that peptide gives almost complete inhibition of the channel. So what does this peptide do? Well, this is an extraordinarily potent inhibitor of the channel. So this peptide inhibits both the rat and the human azic one a with an IC50 we published at the time of around 400 to 500 picomolar. The difficulty is in measuring something with that low potency is you have to be very careful about on and off rates. It turns out that we didn't leave quite enough time for the peptide to bind in those early experiments. More recent data suggests that this peptide has actually an IC50 of less than 200 picomolar on the um, human channel, the KD50 of less than 50 picomolar. So it's an incredibly potent inhibitor of human and rat azic one a To give you some idea for those of you that don't know, don't work in this field, the best known small molecule inhibitor of this channel is an antidiuretic drug called amelioride. This peptide is 50,000 fold more potent than that small molecule drug. So it's incredibly potent. It's also very selective. I won't go through the data here, but what this data tells us on the left is that it has over 2,000 fold selectivity for ASIC 1A over some of those ASIC, other ASIC subtypes that I mentioned previously. And what was really nice is that it's not very reversible. So it's slow on and slow off binding. Um, and so if you inhibit the channel, so this is um, just as it current here control with no peptide. If you try and wash off that other molecule I mentioned, PCTX1, you can see it recovers reasonably quickly. So after 30 minutes of washing out the peptide off the channel, you fully recover the currents. But you can see with HO1A, you get very, very slow recovery of current. And from a therapeutic perspective, that's really nice as well. So it's tight binding and very slow off. And that's good from a drug point of view. How does it work? Remember, we're trying to prevent activation of the channel. Uh, these channels are really interesting in that they, they are activated by protons. They go, they open up, but they rapidly desensitize. And there's a slow recovery, and, and these desensitized channels can't be reactivated. There's a slow recovery from that desensitized state before they can be activated again. So we teamed up with Joe Lynch or Angelo Karamidis in Joe's lab, did some single channel experiments. For those of you that are interested, that are unfamiliar with this field, uh, in these experiments, you capture just a single channel. You're looking at currents from just one ASIC 1A channel. So they're very small. These are two picoamp currents. And you can see in the absence of the peptide, as soon as you drop the pH, this channel activates. So a downward deflection here means the channel's on, and then it, it sort of flickers between on and off. But you can see it quickly turns on. But in the presence of just five nanomolar of this venom peptide, you can see once you drop the pH, it really does not want to turn on. It's really struggling to get a few flickerings here. So what it's doing, and you can see that that's quantified over here, what it's doing is exactly what we want. It's preventing the activation of the channel, and it's exactly what we were hoping to find. So this molecule has the right characteristics uh, for us to test our hypothesis. So we did that first in a model of a stroke. Uh, this data is published. So I don't want to spend too much time on it. It's a, it's a model of stroke that's induced in uh, conscious rats, so con conscious spontaneously hypertensive rats. And I said the data is published, so I've just shown a summary of it here. But what was amazing is when we gave a single dose of this peptide ICV, so this is not a way you'd administer it in the clinic, it was proof of principle, but when we injected it directly into the brain um, at two hours after stroke, so some significant time after the onset of the stroke, and that's really important for reasons I'll explain in a minute, we got an 83% reduction in the size of the brain injury. The reason this time period is important is that about 60% of people that have a stroke take at least two hours to get to a hospital. So if your drug only works at one hour after a stroke, it's gonna be no good clinically. We then went to four hours after stroke, and again, we got a massive reduction in brain injury and even when we delivered the drug eight hours after the onset of the stroke, we still reduced the size of the brain injury by two thirds. So that was fantastic. 
What's important though is for survivors is not just how big is the 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 uh, injury in the brain from a visual point of view is what's the behavioural performance like? What's your quality of life like? And, and when, therefore we looked at the neurological performance and the motor performance of those rodents uh, four hour, for those, that group that had got the drug four hours after stroke. And you can see that, I won't go through the details, but massive improvement in neurological performance, massive improvement in their motor performance. So not only is this drug protecting the brain, it's giving better behavioural performance. It's sparing neurons. Why, why is this important? We think it's important because at the moment, there's only one drug for stroke and it's really problematic. It's, it's a clot-busting drug. There are two types of stroke. There's an ischemic stroke and a hemorrhagic stroke. A hemorrhagic stroke is a bleed in the brain. You can't give this drug to a person with a hemorrhagic stroke. It would make it worse. What that means, therefore, is you can't give this drug to a stroke patient until you take them to the hospital, image their brain, and find out what sort of stroke it is. And the problem is they're losing 2 million neurons a minute during that period of time. So the hope is a drug like this, first responders, paramedics could deliver straight away as soon as the patient was found, which would spare a lot of neurons. And of course, there's a large treatment window and it's compatible with current reperfusion strategies. But I wanna move on to the new stuff because I'm running out of time. So the question we asked is, is, given that it had such a profound effect on ischemic injury of the brain, is it important for other ischemic events as well? And if you look at the amount of time you can keep an organ that you've taken out of a donor for transplant, you can see that the heart is the organ that's most susceptible to ischemic injury. You can only keep a human heart for about four hours um, up until the time you transplant it, whereas you can keep a kidney for up to two days. So the question was, is ASIC-1A important in the ischemic injury of, of the heart? So this is where we teamed up with an, uh, Nathan Palpant at our institute, who's an expert in cardiovascular physiology. And we were able to access some transcript data that showed that ASIC-1A was in fact expressed in mouse cardiomyocytes, both in young and old mice. And the expression levels didn't change after mitochondrial infarction. We wanted to see whether that was true in humans. What Nathan can do is program pluripotent stem cells and turn them into differentiated human cardiomyocytes. So we took those human cardiomyocytes and profiled them. And indeed, we just like the mouse cardiomyocytes, we saw significant ASIC-1A, none of the other subtypes. And while it's a relatively small amount, there's more ASIC-1A than there is the NAV1.5 channel, which is the key channel for generation of active potentials in the heart. So significant levels. So we wanted to see whether that channel, the ASIC-1A channel was involved in ischemic injury of the heart. And if there we set up this um, ex vivo model of ischemia reperfusion injury, it's called a Langendorf model where you can take a heart out of a rodent and you can perfuse it retrogradely through the aorta. And uh, for those of you that have never seen one of these, this is actually a, a rat heart on a Langendorf rig beating at a couple of hundred beats per minute. And you can keep it alive for several hours. Um, and therefore you can take this heart and effectively give it a heart attack ex vivo. So what we did was um, stop perfusing those hearts on a Langendorf rig. So these are mouse hearts in this case, stop perfusing them. And what we did initially was we just wanted to see whether if we knocked ASIC-1A, out in a rodent heart, would it recover better after uh, giving it a heart attack ex vivo? So we're looking at left ventricular developed pressure here. You can see when we cut off the perfusion for 25 minutes, um, there's no developed pressure. And then when we um, allow the perfuser reperfusion of that heart, you see this reperfusion injury, which, which is a, um, where you see recovery of the developed pressure for a small period of time, but then it collapses again. That's the, that's the reperfusion injury. And then it starts to slowly recover. What's interesting here is you can see these are the wild type mice. They don't recover a lot of the developed pressure. And you can see the knockout mice actually do better. So then we took regular mice, gave them the same injury and asked whether we could recover heart function using just 10 nanomoles of this peptide. And you can see we get much, much better recovery in the presence of the peptide. So that was pretty exciting. Um, 
But of course, we wanted to show that that was true in vivo as well. So then we went to an in vivo model of heart attack or myocardial infarction. And so in this case here, we do surgery. We occlude the left um, um, descending artery. Uh, we gave drug at the time of occlusion. And then we followed up with echo at one week, then echo and histology at four weeks. And what we're looking at here are the hearts at four weeks with Mason's trichome stain. And, and the blue here indicates fibrosis and that's quantified here. And so you can see, you see about a 50% reduction in the level of fibrosis in the heart uh, in the presence of the peptide. Now, the reason that's important is the heart has no capacity at all to regenerate cardiomyocytes that are lost during a heart attack. So where you see fibrosis there is, is, is loss of heart muscle tissue, and that can never, ever be regained. So the more heart muscle you can, you can retain during the heart attack, the better that heart's going to be in the long run. These are measures of cardiac performance four weeks down the track. Uh, the most important one is this thing called ejection fraction. It's a really good predictor of heart failure. If this falls below 40%, which it, it is in the hearts that were untreated at about 40%, this, this indicates that you're going to develop heart failure down the track. You really want to be closer to 50 and above. And you can see the animals that got treated with the drug had significantly improved ejection fraction. Now, I've... I think a lot of you are probably thinking at the moment, well, that's all really very nice, but you've given the drug before the injury and you don't know when you're going to have a heart attack. So that's not very, very useful. And that's absolutely true. But there are instances where you know you are going to give the heart an ischemic injury and you will want to give the drug beforehand. And a classic example is coronary artery bypass surgery, where you're going to clamp off the heart. It's going to lose its oxygen supply for a period of time it is going to suffer an ischemic injury. And in that circumstance, you would want to give the drug before you induce the injury. And so that's, that's the experiment I just showed you. So this would be equivalent to therapy prior to surgery. But we've subsequently gone on and looked at the scenario where we give the drug after the injury. And we've also looked at treatment just prior, prior to reperfusing, which would be uh, equivalent to somebody ending up in hospital or having something called percutaneous coronary intervention where the arteries opened up. So you can see the drug works in all circumstances, and that was really exciting. It means there's a we've got significant flexibility with respect to the time we could administer this in terms of various types of ischemic injuries to the heart. Gregor, how much time do I have left? Okay, I just want to say a couple of maybe a couple of minutes uh, still. Okay. These, these are kind of the last data. So I just want to show you this because this, this is really amazing. The most serious ischemic injury you can give a heart is um, take it out of a human. So in other words, a donor heart, once you take it out, has no oxygen supply. It's, it gets a very severe ischemic injury. And we therefore teamed up with the heart transplant team down at the Victor Chang Cardiac Research Institute in Sydney, the Prince of Wales Hospital. And I talked to the heart transplant surgeons down there and I said, so... What do you do with your heart when you take it out of the donor? How do you treat it? What do you do with it to keep it happy? And they said, oh, we, we put it in buffer and throw it in an ice box. And I laughed and said, no, what do you really do with it? And they said, that's what we really do with it. So that is the standard of care for a human heart. You take it out, you put it in preservation solution and you stick it in an ice box. And that's why it only lasts four hours because it has basically no oxygen supply. So we said, well, let's see what the drug can do for these hearts. So what we did was take... Rat hearts, we store them for eight hours, way more than you normally would be able to do. Um, and you can see that in the presence of 10 nanomolar of the drug, which is the green bars here, we get massive improvement in all the cardiac parameters, things like aortic flow and cardiac output. So we think this drug also is going to be useful for preserving the integrity of donor hearts, hopefully increasing the donor pool as well. So this is the final slide, take home messages. I hope I've convinced you that this unusual channel is involved in ischemic injuries of the heart and the brain and possibly other organs. And we think this unusual and complex venom peptide has potential therapeutic applications in stroke and heart attack and heart transplant, as I've talked about, but also possibly in cardiac surgery and cardiac arrest. Where we're heading at the moment is, is, is finalising some preclinical studies over the next year so we can hopefully get permission to go into clinical trials. 
So um, I've mentioned most of the people that were involved uh, along the way. I, I would particularly want to uh, thank two amazing alumni, Irene and Sandy, without whom uh, none of this would have happened. Uh, I want to thank you all for your time um, and interest and uh, happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, fantastic lecture, fantastic uh, presentation of how uh, toxins uh, could be used in uh, biomedical uh, applications. Uh, there's quite a number of questions, actually, uh, cool. quite nice ones, and uh, I'll now uh, try to moderate the discussion based on this. So to start with, um, Julia Zancoli asked um, maybe a, um, um, a, a, a new question that in response to an artery blockage, neurons send the apoptosis and necrosis signal. Uh, mm -hmm. Why do they do that? What is the evolutionary advantage? Uh, and then the next question, maybe similar to this, what's the purpose of ASIC-1 activation after stroke and heart attack if it only worsens the damage? Yeah, that's an absolutely fantastic question. Uh, and we've, we've thought about that a lot. Um, we think the reason is that the, the tissue is at severe risk uh, and, and after the heart attack and stroke. So the organ is suffering really severe energy deprivation. And what happens is you start with a, a core of injury and that, that spreads out over a period of time. And, and we think what's happening is it's, it's, it's when it gets to a serious point, it causes the core to commit suicide to preserve the greater part of the organ because otherwise that damage is just going to spread more and more and more. So we think it's it's, it's sacrificing a small portion of tissue to save a larger portion of tissue. Uh, that's the only reason we can think of. But it, it is an is interesting question. Why is it doing it? Thank you. There's a question with regards to the uh, three-dimensional structure of the peptide. Uh, are all the diesel feed bridges necessary for the activity? Yeah, we think so. Both we think all the disulfide bridges are necessary, and we think, and we certainly both domains are necessary. And and the two, the differences between the domains are important. There's another molecule called PCTX1, which is discovered in Michelle Lezdunsky's group, which looks very similar to the first domain of this one. But if you take two PCTX1 molecules and join them together, you don't get anywhere near the same affinity you do with this molecule. So there's something special about that second domain, which by itself has absolutely no activity. So it's a real mystery. We've been trying to solve the structure of it down to the channel. So we actually have, we haven't published it, we have a, a, both a crystal structure and a cryo-EM structure of the human channel. Uh, but for the life of us, we can't seem to get it uh, with, with HO1A bound, but uh, we, we're struggling. Yeah, maybe related to a structural question. Uh, so uh, are you having a plans to modify the peptide to reach the brain as a potential drug for stroke? Yeah, it's a great question. I think Maria asked that question. Um, great question, Maria. Um, yeah, look, we thought about that a lot and we have several strategies. There's a drug in phase three clinical trials at the moment, also a peptide, not a venom peptide, but a peptide. What they did, Maria, was added TAT to it. Seems like a strange strategy, but it seems to have worked. They got some efficacy in their phase three clinical trials and they're doing another phase three now. What we've done instead is, um, some of you may know of an approach developed by Hiroaki Suga uh, called rapid technology, where you can evolve small cyclic peptides um, and screen them against your target. And since we were making ASIC 1A for structure biology, we, we actually had the, the channel. We were able to do that screen with Hiroaki. We have some incredibly potent, very small cyclic peptides, also pick a molar in the best cases. We think they are probably going to be better options. And what's really interesting about those peptides is they seem to have uh, in vitro evolved the, the active side of the venom peptide. So if you look at the what we know is the active region of the venom peptide and you look at these cyclic peptides, there's a lot of similarities. So it's pretty remarkable. But I agree, Maria, it's a really, really important question. I, the, the, I mean, the other point I'd make about that too is increasingly in the United States, they're using intra-arterial injection of TPA. So you can inject into a cerebral artery and that kind of gets around the problem a little bit. Okay. So... Uh... When you apply it to rodents, uh, do you observe any side effects uh, uh, apart from what you're looking for? 
Yeah, also also a great question. One of the things we really like about this target, and I think you know the people in the audience that work on Aziguane will know this, is you can knock this channel out, and there are no at very you know it might have some effect on fear conditioning, but there's really no observable phenotype from knocking out this channel. So we don't think you can ever get on channel toxicity. You can't overdose on the channel itself, which is good. We've not observed any side effects. We've obviously tested against all the key cardiac ion channels like HERG, and it doesn't have any activity on those. So yeah, so far we've not seen any. It looks, looks to be super safe. Okay, and then, then there was a great question about the biological role of this peptide. Um, is it insecticide? Mm. Do you know what's the target <laughs> of this peptide? That's a great question. Another wonderful mystery. Um, look, we don't know. Um, we think um, this, these, these peptides that modulate these channels have different effects on channels from different organisms, which is another reason why you've got to be really careful what preclinical models you use. So, so PCTX1, for example, activates the chicken channel rather than inhibits it and um, so you could imagine that that birds uh, would be would be a predator of spiders and it may be possibly that these things are activating um, as channels that are acting as pain receptors in predators of the spider so we think they might be defensive molecules but we don't really know Okay, uh, then maybe um, a, a rather technical question regarding to the voltage clamp experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, so how did you change the pH uh, in the voltage clamp experiment? Was it that you add an acid or did you exchange the buffer? So the question really is, if you did the later, how did you uh, avoid inhibitors simply getting washed away um, from the system? Um... That's a good question. No, it's just it's so it's it's uh, just rapid perfusion, and the binding is tight enough that it doesn't matter. I think. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there's maybe another question uh, related to that. So uh, you mentioned that there's apparently uh, a slow off rate uh, mm. that was observed. So. Uh, have you ruled out the, an increased internalization of the receptor during exposure to the to the peptide uh, as a source? Yeah, you haven't looked at, yeah, haven't looked at that. Haven't looked. At, all we, all we, what we do now is if you inject it, say IV, um, we know the half life in mice. So the PK is only about 20, 25 minutes, and yet you can still see it if you fluorescently label it or radio label it. You can still see it bound to the heart five hours later. Um, so whether, whether it's internalized though, we don't know, um, but it, but it certainly stays stuck. Uh, okay. Um, so, uh, maybe one last question. Um, uh, so could you comment on the feasibility of clinical trials for the stroke versus the cardiac surgery or transplant indication? Yeah, it's a good question. Look, um, we've been, we've been, we spent a long time thinking about this, about what's the first clinical trial we should do. We decided that it will be myocardial infarction. There's a particular group of, my, of heart attack patients who end up getting very severe heart attacks. These are patients with something called ST segment elevation, myocardial infarction or STEMI. They have full thickness um, occlusion and they usually get very severe heart attacks. Those people always end up in a cath lab where they have to get a balloon angioplasty and a stent. So they all get treated in the same way. Um, it makes it easy to deliver the drug because they're all in a laboratory getting this, this stenting operation. So we think that's the group we'll, we'll look at first. We know they end up with very severe heart attacks. We think we have an opportunity to try and make that a lot better. And we know it's a pretty homogeneous population in the sense that all, they all get treated in the same way. Um, so we, we, we think that's the first population we'll go for. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Glenn, again, for excellent Pleasure. talk and uh, the discussion. There's a lot of appreciation uh, on the chat. So uh, really, thank you very much that you were able to join. Hopefully we'll see Pleasure. us in person. In the near yeah, let's hope so. <laughs> thank you, so, Gregor. Yeah, thank you. So I'm handing over to Maria Economopoulou from IMDEA Food Institute, Spain, uh, who will chair now the first oral session of this afternoon. Please, Maria. 
Right. Thank you. Thank you, Gregor. And thank you, Glenn, for this uh, fascinating uh, presentation and, and talk. Very inspiring. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first uh, oral session for today, the last day of the first UVEN uh, Congress. Before we start, as Gregor has just go through very quickly that the same housekeeping rules apply in the Zoom. Um, as you do, please uh, maintain to have off uh, the camera as well as the microphone, unless you are presenting, but please continue asking questions through the Zoom uh, chat. So for the presenters, um, is uh, 10 minutes talks presentations, including questions. So please try to finish a few minutes earlier and that will allow time to answer the questions. Uh, when it's uh, close to seven minutes, I will just signal you. So I think we can start. Uh, the first speaker for, uh, for today is uh, uh, Goran Gaziski from the Institute for Medical Research and Occupational Health from Croatia. So Goran, if you are here. Yes, I'm here. Thank fantastic. you. Fantastic. So when you're ready, please start your presentation. Thank you. The screen sharing is disabled by the host, so. I think the IT will be able to, ah, here ah, okay. I think you can start now. So now it's on. Thanks. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Goran Gajski from the Institute for Medical Research and Occupational Health in 